Hi, everybody. Hope you all had a good lunch. Hello. Good to see you. Um, so I am Patrick Gabridge. I am a local playwright and also producing artistic director of Plays in Place, which is a theater company that specializes in site-specific plays in partnership with museums and historic spaces. Um, so today, uh, this afternoon, my talk is, it has this really, thing, I wanted it to sound like a really academic name, the kaleidoscopic look at the formation of American identity through the lens of Mount Auburn Cemetery. It's like a real mouthful, I really like that. But um, really, it's just little bits of history stuff that I like and I'm writing about at Mount Auburn Cemetery. That's, that's really what we're talking about today. Well, well, but it is all related to American identity. Um, Right now, I happen to be the artist in residence at Mount Auburn Cemetery. This is my second of two years. So I'm actually writing a bunch of site-specific plays that will be done there in both um, June and September. And I have postcards for people who are interested. I have them. And if I don't take them out, I'll forget to make them available. And then I'll have spent a lot of time this week going to get them for nothing. So um, <laughs> do come get a postcard later if you're interested. But postcards postcard are pictures uh, from the readings. We can pass them around. How's that? <laughs> so, um, so what's kind of cool is I was allowed to kind of write about whatever I like. I tend to write a lot of history stuff. When we're doing the plays, we're going to do a set of five plays in June that are mostly around natural subjects, but two historical naturalists we're talking about then. And each of these, when you go see the production, the audience will move from site to site to site around the grounds of the cemetery. So, and it'll, we'll probably seat maybe 35 at a time. Um, and these are plays very much written for their specific spots around these specific people. In September, we're doing uh, the America plays, which are plays that are really grounded in questions of American history and identity, uh, all attached to Mount Auburn Cemetery, which is, it has a real interesting history and role in America, and just, to me, is reflecting on some interesting moments of uh, shaping our American identity. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, <coughs> so we'll talk a little bit about Mount Auburn Cemetery and then about some of the people that I'm, that I'm writing about. Cemeteries did not used to be very pleasant places. You might think they're off and not now, but they used to be really terrible places back in the 16th, 1700s, and even into the early 1800s, especially in cities. Uh, so here's an example of uh, some London cemetery that's probably overcrowded. And I mean, there were, it, was, it was unsanitary. They were, they were always running out of room in the big cities, especially like London and Boston, Paris, New York. Um, and they were tended to be in church graveyards. They tended to be denominational in their function. And I mean, literally, there'd be bones poking out of the earth. They smelled bad. There were no plantings. There were no trees and anything. And so it was just kind of terrible places. And if you look, even if you look at like uh, the Granary Burial Ground, which is right across the street from where we enter today, it's pretty crowded. Um, and you've kind of got this Calvinist bent, especially in, in uh, the British colonies. You know, look at these, these slate headstones with death's heads carved on them. And it was pretty much kind of like, you're going to be here soon, you better behave. Um, and so, which is fine, but maybe, maybe not very soothing. And, you know, uh, granaries started in 1660, so it's been filling up for a while. Uh, People in cities are starting to say, what are we going to do about this? It's unsanitary, as they start to understand what sanitation means. Um, and so maybe we could do something better. Along comes Paris, think forward thinking a little bit. And they start in 1804, the Père Lachaise Cemetery, uh, which you may know as like the burial site of Oscar Wilde and Jim Morrison, Chopin, Eden Thea, Edith uh, Piaf. Uh, that was a, this was a new idea at the time. So this is in the 20th arrondissement. Uh, up in the hill above the city. So it felt kind of out of town at the time, uh, but they needed a new place to bury people that wasn't overly full. And it, it had a little, it took a little marketing effort to kind of get it going. It was a non-religious ceremony. So some people were upset at a uh, cemetery. It was, people weren't sure what to make of that. Um, but by 1830, so in 25 years, it had 33,000 people buried there. So it was, it was kind of catching on. And now it says that more than a million people are buried there. It's not, pastoral per se, because it's kind of crowded, as you can see. But it was different. It's different from what we're looking at in church graveyards and stuff. It was, it was much more intentional a place that you could go visit. Well, back in Boston, 
in the 18, uh, 1820s and 30s, people were trying to figure out, well, maybe what can we do about Boston? And there were some men who got together uh, and said, you know, maybe we can do something different. What if we make a cemetery, much like Perilicious, a little bit outside of town? What if we do something in Cambridge that could be Boston's burial ground? Um, and they came across Sweet Auburn, also known as uh, Stone's Woods, this uh, stone farm, which was owned by George Brimmer, you may recognize his name, Brimmer and May uh, School. He's, he's the Brimmer. Um, the, so the, the founders of Mount Auburn thought, well, we can make something that is uh, a lot more sanitary, but also peaceful and, and giving comfort and solace to the bereaved at the same time. Uh, so it's a whole different mindset of like how we're going to relate to death and burial. Uh, and at a time of, of thought where people are thinking, starting to think differently about things in the, in the early 1800s. And so these guys uh, arranged to buy for 72, buy 72 acres in 1830 for $6,000. Uh, which today is $164,000. I did, did the math on that one. Uh, it has since grown to 174 acres, but 72 acres was pretty big. And it's not, it was a bit out of town, so from Boston. It's close to Harvard, so a lot of people like Longfellow and the people like that would wander over to this place. It was a place of picnicking and things like that. It was kind of a pretty area um, to Sweet Auburn. And there are many, there are poems referencing it. And it begins, it's going to end up having an important part in kind of American literature and thought. And, uh, but they, they arranged to do this, and they've kind of got a little bit of a, a trick to it. They need to figure out, you know, how are we going to make the money to do this? So they sell subscriptions. They're selling the lots to the cemetery. And so their goal is to sell 100 at $60 a piece. And so as soon as they sell that 100 then they can buy the land and start the cemetery. That's, that's the goal uh, that these three guys are kind of charged with doing. Um, and $60 um, is a lot of money, but it's not a crazy amount of money. So $60 back then is theoretically worth around $1,600 today. Uh, but the more useful thing is to say, well, $60 back then, how much did someone make in a year? And the average farm laborer was making, say, $130. A clockmaker might make $250. So it was a lot of money, but it wasn't like you had to be Bill Gates' money to buy into the cemetery. And it was going to be non-denominational. These three guys are all Unitarians, and the Unitarians have kind of taken over uh, power from the Congregationalists in Massachusetts by this time. So there's, there's interesting kind of philosophical debate that's happening around religion and, and how we treat people. Um, so they're able to, to sell this pretty quickly. So within a year, they're able to raise the money. And so our, our three founders here are um, Henry Dearborn, Joseph Story, and Jacob Bigelow. And um, Dearborn, and the money, the land up is being put up front by, uh, purchased by the Mass Historic uh, Horticultural Society. That's where this is coming from. It's the, the, the owner of Mount Auburn Cemetery at first. Um, so Dearborn uh, was kind of an interesting guy. It, I get a little jealous of guys from the 19th century in that it was, they're all Renaissance men because, partly because it was easier, because the, the, the depth of knowledge you needed to be in a certain field was significantly less. Um, <laughs> So, but, but Dearborn was a congressman. He was a general in the Massachusetts militia. And he was mayor of Roxbury when Roxbury was a separate town from 47 to 51. And he was uh, also really involved in land, uh, landscape architecture. So he helped lay out Mount Arm Cemetery. So a lot of what's there, the, 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 the footprint of it is really much Dearborn's doing. And he actually, <coughs> he's involved and he helps later on start Forest Hill Cemetery. And he's, He's buried there, and he's the founder of Forest Hills. Um, he was the first president of Mass Horticultural Society. Um, and he really saw this as it was going to be an experimental garden and a cemetery. That was, that was the whole idea. And one thing to keep in mind, this, this idea of what they're doing is so radical, the word cemetery is actually not in use in the United States until Mount Auburn exists. Up there, you're a buried in a churchyard or a graveyard, but the word cemetery is not, it's just not part of the lexicon. It, this is starting here. It, it's, we, we take it for granted, I think, because it's just here and we've all, it seems like it's always been here. But this whole idea of this kind of pastoral cemetery does not exist until these guys come up with it. Uh, with, we can go to Perilous and say it's like that, but this is a little different. Um, 
what's kind of interesting is, so Dearborn wants this experimental garden. People are a lot more interested in the cemetery. So the experimental garden goes nowhere, and by 35, they split. Uh, so the Horticultural Society kind of takes their their pennies and goes home, and Mount Auburn becomes its own separate thing. But Mass Horticultural, because they started the whole thing, they get this odd sweetheart deal out of it. They get to keep 25% of all the sales of Mount Auburn lots, theoretically in perpetuity. Um, so, like, when you see Horticultural Hall, which is across from Symphony Hall, that's paid for by the people who are buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. <laughs> that deal lasts all the way until 1976. Uh, which is the thing I just love about Boston history is that it's long enough and close enough. You're like, because like there are um, there are funds that you can apply for, there are grants you can apply for in Boston that are funded by like Benjamin Franklin put aside some money. I try to remember which fund it is, uh, and it's it's a huge fund now because he put away you know a thousand dollars back in 1775, um, and this is kind of the same thing. I mean the Mass Horticulture Society just kept getting this money forever. Um, and Mass Hort was founded, co-founded by Jacob Bigelow, who we'll talk about in a second. So it was just kind of a, Dearborn was interesting. Um, and a thing to keep in mind is that um, in, in, this, in this era, there's a whole bunch of interesting things. One is that in the 30s, in 1830s, our country is still so young. So we're not fully a nation. Like the U.S. government doesn't exist. A functioning governing uh, the government doesn't exist until March 4th, 1789. So the United States is only 40 years old by this time, and we've just come off this revolutionary period, like where everything is defined by, oh, we're this revolutionary nation, and where 1812 kind of fits in there. It's like, now we're something else. And what are we going to be? How are we going to figure it out? And this notion of American identity is being defined in different places around the country in different ways. The South has their own version. The frontier and the West see America forming in one way. And then there's this kind of interesting intellectual underpinning or tied to Unitarianism that's happening up in the Northeast and especially in New England. And so they're trying to figure stuff out. Like, what is America? And it's kind of, in some ways, it's the most hopeful moment of America's moment. Like, what can we be? And transcendentalism is being born at the same time. And we have a different relationship to nature and each other. So um, Ralph Waldo Emerson publishes Nature in um, 1836. So there's all these kind of ideas floating around right here. So we're trying to figure some stuff out. Um, and the Europeans are like, this is a young country. They're never going to make it. They don't know <laughs> anything about themselves. They don't have a good founding story. They don't have good public statues or monuments. And so the Americans are hearing that, like, we got to do something. We got to confirm our myth. Like, we're trying to figure stuff out. So Bunker Hill Monument is going to be built. That's, and it doesn't start till 25. It's, it's a little while, right? It takes us a while to kind of get some money together and figure out some organizational stuff. We don't have a strong base of artists or architects yet. Um, so, but, so Bunker Hill Monument's going up as, as one of the first big major public monuments to the war and to our founding myth. Um, but it's not finished until 42. Um, so keep in mind that Mount Auburn Cemetery is going on around the same time, and they're think, thinking about, like, how do we commemorate people who are important to our founding, who are important to America, important to New England. Also at this time, there are no public parks like we think of them. The... the uh, Boston Common is a, is a cow pasture. It's, it's not someplace you go and hang out and have a picnic. The, the public garden doesn't happen until the 1860s. So the 1830s, in terms of a rising middle class in this Victorian era that has some income and doesn't just have to spend all their time making their money, they want to go outside and see nature and do stuff, and they have the money to do it a little bit, there's nowhere for them to go. And they're going to end up going to visit their dead relatives in Mount Auburn a lot. Um, and there's not even a good place for them to see art. There's no art museums. The um, MFA doesn't exist till 1870. Uh, there, uh, one option is kind of the Athenaeum, which is early, 1807. But again, it's, it's private. It's exclusive. There's, but it has, it, it's, it's a place, but it's not as quite broadly open as this thing that they're kind of figuring out at Mount Auburn Cemetery. That's going to be a place where you can visit your relatives, and you can think about art and nature and all these things. It's pretty forward-looking um, at the time. So Joseph Story, I love this picture of him. Boy, does he look mean. Uh, <laughs> and this is really scary. It looks, feels like it's out of some like uh, YA uh, book. There's one I'm thinking of. Um, 
but, but he was kind of an interesting guy, and he was a Supreme Court justice from 1812 to 1845, hugely influential, um, Harvard graduate like they all are. Uh, he's buried at Mount Auburn, and um, he, he's, it's also interesting to think about in this era, like 1830 is only 50 years away from the revolution, so it's as far to the revolution as we are from Vietnam. So it's still there. And so like his father was at the Boston Tea Party. So their relationship to old history and new history is kind of, they're really caught in the middle. And so he had a lot, of, he was a very influential uh, jurist, wrote the second most opinions behind John Marshall, ruled in the Amistad case. I mean, Andrew Jackson once called him the most dangerous man in America um, because he was a big supporter of, of national, nationalism uh, in the sense of the Union sense. Um, and he was the first president of Maud Armored Cemetery, and um, he gave the consecration speech in 1831, which is a really powerful speech, very much of the time. It's really long, uh, but so beautifully crafted. It's just amazing <coughs> and really heartfelt. Uh, he's a guy who, like many people of that time period, lost you know children, and, and there are many children buried at Mount Auburn. Uh, he had he, he had when he gave the speech in 31, he had just buried his 10 year old daughter. Um, and it was the, that was, he lost five child, children in 15 years. Um, so he was really well acquainted with this. But the speech he gives at this spot, at the, at the, at the Consecration Dell now, uh, this, you can't, that kind of gives you a better sense of what it looks like. It's kind of this natural amphitheater. There were between two and 3,000 people came to hear him give the speech in September of 1831. Um, really interesting, influential period. And then we have Jacob Bigelow, who was, the second president of Mount Auburn uh, in from 45 to 60, the longest time period. He was kind of, he has the kind of the history that I like. Like he was a botanist, he was a physician, he was an architect, um, uh, he helped start MIT. Uh, he just did all these things and he was against heroic medicine. So he, he was, because he was a botanist, he kind of understood the value of plants as, and their medicinal uses and was against kind of like bleeding people and weird things that weren't really doing anything. And he designed a lot of the elements that are at Mount Auburn Cemetery in addition to like working at Harvard Medical School and all this stuff. He also designed Washington Tower and this Egyptian gate, which was originally built in wood for like 20 years and they're like, this is not gonna work. Um, so they, <laughs> they put that into stone. And then um, he designed this chapel, which has just recently been renovated. If you get a chance to go over, highly recommend it. The rose window has been restored. And now there's actually a different structure on the right-hand side there because they have a restored crematory on the back. And there are also leaders, the, Mount Auburn's just amazing. They're forward-looking in so many ways and like they're at the, the forefront of cremation and they have a really cool state-of-the-art crematory now. Get a tour if you can. <laughs> in the, in, in, while you're alive. Um, <laughs> and they also, he designed the Civil War sculpture uh, in, that was installed in 72. And it was just really fascinating uh, monument to the Civil War. Again, in 72, it's still so fresh. And, you know, it's this moment of American definition. If, if anything, the Revolution and, uh, and obviously the Civil War are probably the two most defining moments of our history. And he really chose to, to encapsulate it in this kind of really grounded classical way um, and not as a soldier and not as a victim, but as a question, right? And um, I love the uh, inscription on it. It says, American Union preserved, African slavery destroyed by the uprising of a great people by the blood of fallen heroes. I was like, oh yeah, I like this guy a lot. <laughs> then anytime you do digging into historical figures, <laughs> <laughs> that's always a problem when you really like people uh, from, the 19, from the 1800s. Uh, it's a complicated time. So he had good friends in Richmond who were slave owners before the war, and he's like, got a letter back to, home, from, to his wife. It's like, oh, I was at the slave market. May I'll pick one up for you? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you're like, oh, Jacob. Uh, so, he, but he's interesting, and he's interesting and complex, and I think I, this monument still kind of redeems him for me, but there's some other things that you hear about him, maybe not so much. Um, that Sphinx was sculpted by Martin Milmore, who's a hotshot sculptor, an Irishman who had immigrated as a child during the Great Hunger. Um, he studied and had a, where are we going to? 2.30, right? 
Okay. <laughs> um, he uh, was fortunate in that his father was a, a schoolmaster who died when he was young, which is unfortunate, but he had some education. So he and his two brothers came over and were involved in, the, in art and sculpture. And he studied with uh, Thomas Ball, who was a pretty famous sculptor. And um, he worked at the studio building in Boston uh, early on and while, while he's doing his, his Boston work, um, which I discovered, I thought it was at the piano factory, but it turns out, no, it was 100 Tremont Street which is where we're standing right now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what? So yeah, so he, he and a lot of sculptors were working right in this very spot uh, back in the, he was working there in 1860s. So this is kind of cool to think, oh, he was here um, <laughs> making his designs. And so he designed the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which you'll recognize from Boston Common. Uh, and that was a really complicated monument because there's a lot, if you go there and look at it, you're like, oh, he worked really hard, he earned his money on that one, because there's a lot of sculptures that he, that he did. And this, he did all the sculpture work in Rome. So at the time, a lot of American sculptors had to work in Rome because that's where the marble was, and that's where the kind of skilled workmen were to execute your design into there. And that's where all the sculptors were. And also where all the sculptures were, if you were studying, at this time, neoclassicism was the style. So your examples that you want to see are in Rome. So you're going you're gonna to want to go there and, and catch up with it. Uh, he designs this kind of iconic Civil War monument that you'll see. He, sadly, he died very young. Um, he was dead by 39 from cirrhosis. And you got to drink pretty hard to die of cirrhosis <coughs> in your 30s. So he had kind of a tragic life. And we, we have a play about him and Bigelow uh, and the monument uh, in the series that we're doing, which is uh, I, it's a play that I like. Um, there's a lot of sculptures, as I was talking about, in Mount Auburn Cemetery that are worth looking at, and just there's a huge influence of different sculptors making an impact there. And one of them is Edmonia Lewis. This is a sculpture of uh, Hygieia, a, a statue that was sculpted by Edmonia Lewis, who was the first uh, black woman sculptor, black, American black woman sculptor in America, and she was working in Rome for through the mid 1860s and 70s and the sculpture was commissioned by uh, Harriet Keziah Hunt who was the first one of the first women physicians in America and she commissioned her to make the statue of the goddess of hygiene and it is right near uh, Hunt's grave. Uh, Edmonia was just a really interesting character. She was born in Buffalo, her parents died early and she was uh, African American, African American, and Native American. And so when her parents died, she actually went to go live with her relatives near Buffalo, uh, her Native American relatives. And so she, her, her, her name in the tribe was Wildfire, which was kind of interesting. And, but she was super smart and, and just found a way, her and her brother, to kind of get ahead. Am I blocking your way? Sorry. <laughs> so um, she went to Oberlin. So she was college educated, though. Oberlin was really cool and that it was opening its doors to people of color very, you know, at the very beginning, very early on, but it doesn't mean she didn't face hardships and, and discrimination. And so she was caught up with an incident where her roommates accused her of poisoning them because they had tried Spanish fly as an aphrodisiac apparently and made themselves really sick. So they blamed her, um, which got her in trouble. And then she was assaulted and beaten by townspeople and was dragged, you know, like, ended up at the trial, you know, on crutches. Um, so she ends up forced to leave. She's it's acquitted, but is forced to leave Oberlin and moves to Boston and takes up sculpture uh, in 1864 um, and turns out to be really, really talented. And, and at the time, keep in mind, um, you know, abolitionists are, are working really hard to kind of establish how African-Americans are fully human for lack of better phrasing of it. And so like uh, Lydia Marie Child takes her under her wing and is kind of a patron, but also somewhat patronizing. So they have kind of a push-pull relationship uh, for sure. And Lydia Marie Child is championing other artists and also uh, other uh, Afro-American people. Um, what's kind of cool is that she is really encouraged to leave here and go to Rome by Harriet Hosmer, who has come back to town to, who, who is a, a Watertown born sculptor uh, is in town exhibiting something and so she 
and maybe a few other people are encouraging Edmonio, come to Rome and you'll have a lot of freedom and you'll have the ability to work, and she does. And so she works in Rome for um, probably 20 plus years. Her, um, and her, she's operating in the neoclassic style, but um, you can see like this sculpture, Forever Free here is actually starting to trend towards a, a more modern take on sculpture. Uh, so she has a whole series of uh, sculptures related to some of uh, Longfellow's poetry around the Song of Hiawatha that are super interesting and you should go look her up. Uh, her Death of Cleopatra is just, I find, just a stunning, stunning uh, sculpture. It was, ex and so uh, Edmonia Lewis is, is famous internationally, and Death of Cleopatra is interesting. It goes to the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 76, 1876, and remains unsold. Um, some gambler buys it and uses it as a headstone to his horse named Cleopatra that died at the racetrack in Chicago where he lived. And it stays there, honest to God, for 100 years, just in some overgrown old racetrack until the U.S. Postal Service finds it for some reason. Then it's painted by a bunch of Boy Scouts. And then finally, Marilyn Richardson, who's a scholar uh, in Boston uh, of uh, ammonia, finds it. Somehow, I don't know how she tracked it down. I have to ask her. I've talked to her a couple times. She's amazing. Uh, and it's restored, and it's in the Smithsonian now. <laughs> you make a whole story just around the sculpture. It's kind of crazy. Um, and so she's commissioned by Harriet Keziah Hunt, who is a physician, mostly self-educated at this time. Medical schools kind of are developing. They're not for women. Uh, her father dies in 27 when she's only 22, so she kind of has to make it on her own, and she studies medicine with some people who are kind of quackish, but uh, she ends up being a really good physician. She's able to treat women, because Victorian era is really crazy, right? So women and men can't really talk about certain body parts, even to your doctor, so women get untreated for all kinds of things. It's horrible. Um, but now you have a woman physician who can help deal with you, and her, her philosophy is like, she's a strong supporter of suffrage and women's rights and is very active in the movement in the 1850s. And she's like, M mind and body are connected and if you're oppressed, you cannot be fully healthy. That's her take. And now she's, she was awesome. And so um, she stays unmarried for her whole life. Um, and this, how, how things are interconnected in Mount Auburn Cemetery uh, are just so fascinating, because all these people live together, right? And they're all buried together. So we have a play about Bigelow and Hunt, because Harriet Hunt decides, I, I want to be a better doctor. I would like to go to Harvard Medical School and just attend some lectures about, like, anatomy, and so I can know things better, <laughs> right? It would seem a no-brainer, but of course women aren't allowed. As she applies in 47, she is turned down. Guess who's on the committee that turns her down? Jacob Bigelow, uh, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was dean of the medical school at that time. Uh, she reapplies in 1850, and this time Oliver Wendell Holmes says, you know, I think it might be okay. We could, we could allow that to happen. Bigelow still votes no, but she's, she's admitted along with three black male students, uh, which is kind of interesting. The, the men are able to attend for a semester before protests drive them out. Um, Harriet is never really allowed to attend. And there, the men, for, the, for the black men, and remember kind of the time period this is, abolitionism is on, uh, abolitionism is on the rise in the 1850s, so there are, there are supporters of the, of the men. For Harriet, there's nobody. The letters that they write are just terrible. Um, and, and she holds this against them for a long time, against Bigelow. I will say, not, not in his defense, we could just say, and, and the play is a little bit about my imagined Bigelow making an apology to Hunt, um, which never happened, I promise you. Um, <laughs> he had a very, very bad year in 1850 because his daughter was marrying Francis Parkman, who becomes a famous historian, you may have heard him. Um, Francis Parkman is the nephew of George Parkman who was murdered by um, uh, John Webster in the Parkman murder, which is just this horrible, scandalous murder of two Harvard men against each other on the campus that he guys dismembered and tossed into the privy, and then the janitor finds these body parts, 
and goes to Jacob Bigelow and says, I think you need to call the police. Uh, and it's like this huge scandal, and there are th literally thousands of people traipsing through the murder scene. Um, so Bigelow has, a, I would say he had a bad year. He had reason to be cranky, but it still wasn't fair. Um, and she's just, she's just one of my favorite characters. In 1860, she has, hosts a, a silver anniversary party for her marriage to medicine and invites 1,500 of her closest friends. Um, and including Harriet Hosmer is actually at this and gives a speech. Um, and and um, the, uh, the managers of the Hospital for Women and Children present her with a gold ring for her anniversary. So it was just, it was just really fascinating. <laughs> for the record, uh, the first black man to graduate from Harvard Medical School was in 1859. The first women were admitted to Harvard Medical School School. Anybody know this? Uh, wow, you guys are giving them uh, 1945. 1945. I was, I was, uh, I was a little surprised when I hear that number. <laughs> uh, so back to spider webs and how people are connected, and uh, and these are all people that we're exploring in our plays at Mount Auburn too. So a really interesting person buried at Mount Auburn who had a big impact culturally was Charlotte Cushman, and she was born in Boston. She, and she died in the Parker House, which is right around the corner. It's not, I mean, Parker Omni is not the same building, but she was there. Um, she got her start in 1835 on stage at the Tremont Theater age, at the age of 18. And she was super interesting in that she is playing in Romeo and Juliet. That's Charlotte. That's her sister, Susan. She, she played a man a lot of the time. She played Hamlet. She played... Romeo, um, and she also played other women, so she played Lady M, and she played um, she played Queen Catherine and Henry VIII a lot, but she, she made her money as a man on stage, and then even in her personal life, um, she often dressed like a man, and she was in relationships with women almost exclusively. Uh, this is back in the you know 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. So she's super interesting. Um, she retires from the stage in age 50, at age 38, in age 1852. She's super wealthy. She's toured all across the United States and in Europe, and retires. I mean, she keeps going back. She's an actress, uh, but um, she decides she's going to move to Rome uh, with her uh, girlfriend. Uh, 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 Matilda Hayes, who is um, another actress, um, and she actually brings with her a young sculptor from Boston, uh, Harriet Hosmer, uh, and they they had very so like they knew they end up knowing in Rome they know William Wetmore Story, who is the son of Joseph Story, who becomes a sculptor. Uh, so people are all interconnected. So here's Charlotte Cushman with Matilda Hayes, and you can see they're kind of dressed in men's garb up top. And this is kind of common in that area to kind of dress alike with your friends, sometimes today. Um, but yeah, so they were, they were an item for a while. Um, they broke up. Uh, it was kind of a tumultuous relationship, a big story about the big fight, and they're shouting down the streets of Rome, and partly because she had slept with Harriet Hosmer. But I think they were on the outs. I will say they were on the outs. Um, and then here is Charlotte Cushman a little later with Emma Stebbins, who she regarded as her spouse in later in life. And, and they stayed together till the end of Charlotte Cushman. Now, I'm not going to say that Charlotte Cushman didn't have other uh, loves in her life, but that was, that was some of her big ones. Um, Harriet Hosmer is involved with all these people because the Cushmans have this big house in Rome, and they kind of start bringing sculptors with them. She has, Cushman has a fondness for sculptors. So Harriet Hosmer is living in the same house with them. There's a whole bunch of women who've gone there. Again, there's no school of Beaux-Arts in America. So sculptors in America have to go somewhere to study. And so they're going to Rome to learn and to have access to all this stuff. Harriet Hosmer is one of my very favorite people. I know these are all my favorites, but I really like Harriet Hosmer. She's, she's born in Watertown in 1830. And uh, the only daughter of a physician, her mother dies very early, and she's kind of a scamp. I mean, she's just always getting into trouble. She's finally sent off to boarding school and starts having affairs with her co-workers, I mean, uh, uh, fellow students. Um, and she, she sees what happens to um, Harriet Hunt, unable to access Harvard Medical School, but she really wants to be a sculptor. 
at like age 20. She's like, I want to be a sculptor. I'm like, okay. Uh, and so she is, goes to with one of her uh, boarding school friends to study at the Missouri Medical College. She's actually able to study anatomy there to, become, to really perfect her skills at a very young age. Um, she's so interesting. You can, you can check this on your phone. There's actually a hill named for Harriet Hosmer in Lansing, Iowa, because she was engaged in a foot race. They were on a break from some steamship. They were going up, up the Mississippi for some unknown reason, uh, and some boy challenges her to a race up the top of this bluff, and she's like, I'll beat you, and he's like, no, you won't, and so she beats this guy, um, so they named the hill after her. So there is a Mount Hosmer in Lansing, Iowa, to this day, in Hosmer Park, uh, because that's who Harriet Hosmer was. Uh, this is how she lived her life. Um, so anyway, she, she goes to Rome. She meets Charlotte Cushman. She sees her as playing Romeo, and she's like, there is someone like me right there. She's like, I, and she's living her life like me. I need to know, I need to know this woman. So she meets her through connections, and, and Charlotte... <coughs> Hosmer's a cute little thing, invites her back, and, and so is brings her back to the dressing room and gets to know her, and then a year later, she's taking her with her to Rome, uh, and Hosmer just makes it. She is incredibly talented. So this is, this is pretty early on. This is in 53. She's only 23 years old when she sculpts Medusa, and it's a fantastic take on Medusa. If you see sculptures of Medusa from the time period, and this neoclassic era has a bunch of them, Medusa is this you know, harp, horrible harpy. Um, this is a much more sympathetic portrait of Medusa as a beautiful young woman who's suffering from this curse. And so it's, her work is just, is, is pretty amazing. And so she really makes it. And she does other stuff too. Like she, uh, she invents, she has a patent for some kind of artificial marble that she made. She's working on inventing a perpetual motion machine, as you do in the late 19th century. <laughs> uh, she wrote a one-act woman, uh, one act play called 1975, A Prophet Drama, which you can read. You can find it online. Um, it's not great, but it is, it's weird. It's a little science fiction-y. Um, so what is super cool about this time period, and, and a lot of these people are related to um, Mount Auburn Cemetery, is that there were a lot of women working in Rome on, in the sculpture field who were on par with men, who were getting national and international commissions, and think, works that you will recognize. So this, you might not recognize this, this is Zenobia in Chains, which is incredibly powerful, and that's what uh, Edmonia Lewis would have seen exhibited in Boston, um, not far from here. Um, so here is Bethesda Fountain in New York, that's uh, sculpted by Emma Stebbins, so Charlotte Cushman's spouse. This is by Louisa Lander. Uh, this is a, a bust of Nathaniel Hawthorne that, what a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also almost out of time, but I tell the story anyway. Um, so all these women are living in Rome, all sleeping together, really complicated. <laughs> this household is just kind of crazy. Poor Louisa Lander, she goes off and has an affair with some Italian man. And the Victorians are not having that. Because remember, like in Victorian era, women don't have sexual feelings in theory. So there's no word for lesbianism. So, uh, but Lisa Lander has an affair with an Italian man. And she'd been, Hawthorne had been sculpted, had been sitting with her for a while, getting sculpted. But now after the scandal, she's like, he's like, no, you can't, I can't, you can't be seen with my family anymore. And so she's just totally cut from society. She has forced to leave Rome um, because of this. So it's, it's kind of crazy weird time. Um, but you might recognize this maybe down the hall, uh, down the street, family hall. That's by um, Ann Whitney, another Watertown woman. Uh, and this, uh, Charles Sumner at uh, Harvard Yard. Oh, and you'll see this is Vinnie Reams' uh, sculpture of Lincoln from the U.S. Capitol. So these are all kind of iconic images from around here, all sculpted by women. Uh, and most of us don't know that and don't understand how these women were operating. And it all lasts in just like a 20-year period. And after that, the, because of politics here, the Civil War here and in Italy, kind of the climate shifts and everybody leaves. They all go to Paris and then there's entirely different uh, artistic movements that women are not, don't have as much access to. So it's kind of this weird magical moment. Um, but anyway, it's something just to, to take away. This, I made this, this is, <laughs> this is all the people that they were sleeping with. Uh, <laughs> by the way, so like. Hosmer and Charlotte Cushman, and like Hosmer really liked dating these the, the royalty a little bit. So she ends up with Lady Ashburton in 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 London. But like Lady Mary and Alfred like presents her with a ruby ring at one time. Like, 
Uh, and then she's sculpting Maria Sophia, the exiled queen of Naples, which is a sculpture similar to Zenobia, uh, but manages to have date her at the same time. Uh, and she kind of dates Cornelia Crow, who is the daughter of Wayman Crow, who becomes financial advisor to Hosmer and Charlotte Cushman, but Cushman falls in love with Emma Crow, and um, so they have a court affair while she's still married to Emma Stubbins. And Cushman really wants Crow to be around. This is her young girlfriend. So she arranges for her nephew, whom she's now adopted as her son, to marry Emma Crow. And then she knows Secretary of State Seward, and she arranges for Ned to be appointed consul to Rome so that they can all live in the same house together. <laughs> that was kind of how things went in Rome back then. It was, it was pretty wild. Um, and a lot of these people are all buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery, including Sally Mercer, who was... Uh, uh, a black woman who was um, Charlotte's servant, uh, never slave, but a, a servant for, I don't know, probably 50 years and kind of knew all the secrets and was like kind of a grounding figure in this kind of really crazy life. <coughs> um, I'm almost out of time. I will tell you that not all of Mount Auburn is about 19th century interesting weird people. Um, the, the one play that we have, so our plays are a whole series of plays around American history, the last play we have is around Armenia, Armenian immigrants. There's a lot of Armenian immigrants, uh, a big Armenian population in Watertown, and there are 3,000 Armenians buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery out of 100,000 people. So we're focusing on one particular family uh, that has, part they all have tragic stories. But we were really taken, I, I was kind of told this story by some nonprofit groups, and then this, you can't really read this, but this woman, Asneev Kaloust, who's in part of the Amirian family, came here in 1921, but then died in childbirth in 1923. And so just really struck by what does it mean to be forced to leave the country where you're from and be planted here in your grave? Uh, and what does it mean to our society to take in immigrants and refugees and how does that affect who we are as Americans? And so that's kind of, that's, there's a big arc that we're looking at in terms of American identity. Um, and so we are looking at that arc through these plays. And so we did a bunch of readings in September with some fabulous actors, and then we'll be doing plays um, in June and September. And I have got like two minutes left. Um, I could talk about these people all day. I spent a lot of time in the last year with all these people. Our, do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I know that uh, Anne Whitney, for instance, she when she did the Sumner sculpture, she wasn't ultimately allowed to do it because one of the reasons was that they didn't like the idea that she was sculpting around the man's private parts. Yeah. 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 And so what, so was that an issue for women sculptors then? Yeah, it was for Hosmer. I, I don't have images. So like she's got like the sleeping fawn and things like that. So they're, hers, hers can be real sexual, it's sensual, but it has to be careful. Like her, she has, uh, I'm trying to think of Beatrice Sensi is the one where it's like the buttocks of this woman are particularly sensual and you're like, huh, what did, people had mixed feelings about that. But yeah, there was, there was questions about that. They had to be very, they were very careful. Um, yeah, sometimes they got in trouble and sometimes they were just discriminated against pure up. But they, they made stuff. <coughs> yeah, um, how, did, how did you find out about all these women being connected there's a there's a there's a great book called um oh shoot i'm gonna space it out right this second if you contact me i can there's a couple really interesting books um shoot <coughs> ah. there's a couple of good books there's a, there's a there's a pretty good biography by uh culkin about harriet hosmer who gets into this and um Sadly, Marilyn Richardson has not written, there's not a definitive biography of Edmonia Lewis at all, though there is um, Child of the Fire is kind of an art history take on it. It's kind of, art history is a little dry, uh, <laughs> but, but, but there's some good historical stuff in there too. Um, Across an Untried Sea, that's the name of the book uh, that <coughs> half of it is about these women sculptors. Uh, it's going to be my uh, TV series someday. You just wait. Uh, they, they definitely have earned it. Uh, yeah, they're pretty wild. Uh, any other questions? Yep. So in like no time at all, uh, you start there as this uh, in residence, and are you wide open as to what you can do there, or have they yeah. 
they, they didn't say, well, this is what we're going to focus on? Or? Nope. Uh, they said, you, you're, I'm there to be inspired by what I see and experience there. So I had a year to kind of really spend a lot of time there and research and work with the staff and, and figure stuff out. Uh, and then I've been writing super hard because uh, when we're creating production, this is uh, Courtney O'Connor is our director. Um, you know, we, it's a two year residency, but you know, we have to be casting and making plays early. So I was already writing plays uh, three or four months in trying to figure some stuff out. Uh, but I've been research, re researching my heart out for the last year uh, and still going. <laughs> There's actually 11 plays, but the 10 are written. So that's good. Yeah. Question. Um, so is, is Mount Auburn, is it still? Do people get buried now? They do indeed. People that die, they get What's required? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, isn't um, that why they built the fence around it? <laughs> <laughs> Mount Auburn is a fascinating institution, and it's run by some super smart people that are understand that you know it's going to fill up eventually, but they have a very clever master plan uh, that is allowing them to make the most out of the space that they have. There also is a lot more cremations being done there. Um, and they're also... The reason they have artist in residence programs, they have uh, like a full-time naturalist there, they're building it to be an institution that is beyond just what a cemetery is. It's a cultural institution. There are citizen scientists going, there's science going on there. There's a huge uh, herpetology program where they're restoring amphibian life there. So it's, 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 it's pretty smart. As institutions go, it's one of the smartest I've met. So. It's still the cheapest property in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Five square foot. That's probably pretty cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have four dollars before you started that project? No, no. I told them. I said, you know, I think it'll be a series of short plays. Of course, stupid me. I'm like, well, let's do two. Let's do ten. Um, but no, I didn't know anything. I just uh, have been reading really fast. <laughs> so yeah, yep. Yeah. No, I just want to make a comment as a nearby resident. Not over the cemetery is really the birthplace of parks. Yeah. There were no parks before. Uh, it's common was not a park at the time. And people came from all over the country to see it. Uh, it was second only to Niagara Falls in Florida. And all these people would go home and copy it. Exactly. Yeah. So there are cemeteries all across the United States that are that are modeled on this, and it all, you can trace them all right back to Mount Auburn Cemetery. There's this whole movement that happened in the 1800s in cities that you will recognize all around. And so even in New York and stuff, they all start here. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it was a huge tourist attraction. It was the largest uh, New England tourist attraction uh, throughout the 19th century. Yeah. One more. Did you see that blog or something? You can go to my. You can go to our website if you go to playsinplace.com. I have I have uh, postcards. Okay. Might not have a website, uh, and I have I have cards too. I can have these to get cards for mine. So good. Thank you very much. I know we've. Been there. Thank you.